reading of the Holy Gospel according to John, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Holy Trinity Sunday invites us to keep our faith active, to keep moving. We say it regularly without blinking, the Holy Trinity, as if it's a given, as if the sky is blue, roses are red, rainbows are multicolored, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three. Hold on. <laughs> the Holy Trinity. It's a mind-boggling thing, actually. Theologians for centuries have said that the human brain cannot fully comprehend God as Trinity. And yet, God invites us to encounter God's self through a relationship that grows through faith. The Holy Trinity cannot be fully understood, but it is a gift, just like the beauty of a red rose or the fact that there's a blue sky to see or that rainbows appear. All of them are gifts. You don't do anything to earn them. They just come as a gift. So too, the Holy Trinity, a mystery, a gift received by faith. My seminary professor would say, stop the sermon right there and sit down. But you know I'm not going to. <laughs> In this week's gospel reading, Jesus said to his friends, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. I wonder if that doesn't help us on Holy Trinity Sunday. To realize that as his earthly ministry was coming to a close and time was running out, the problem wasn't time, the problem was the disciples. They weren't quite ready to fully understand all that Jesus wanted to convey to him. And so he says these words knowing that they really are going to need to learn what I want to convey to them through experiencing it. Through the washing of the feet, through following to the cross, to a certain extent, to experiencing the empty tomb, to being called forth by the work of the Spirit. It's true, there are some things that we can only learn by experience, like the value of hard work, or the sacrifice made by our parents to raise us, or the beauty of standing atop a mountain and taking in the wonder of God's creation or the capability of a broken heart to mend again. You can't learn those things by reading about them in a book. You have to experience them. And Jesus reassured his disciples that the Holy Spirit would help them in their learning curve, would guide them, didasko, he says. A Greek word that means not only to teach, not just to teach, not just book knowledge, but full immersion knowledge. How else do you learn a language than to be fully immersed in speaking it and hearing it? How else do you learn to fly a plane? I mean, a flight simulator can only go so far, but sometimes you have to get out there and in there and up there to experience it. How else do we learn to do anything, playing a sport or an instrument or to dance? Yesterday was dance day in our family, which means that our two daughters had their dance recital, the culmination of a year's worth of effort 
wonderful to see music and motion coming together. I'm not sure if that's a rhythm I should be dancing to up here or not, but I apologize for the popping in our sound system. Maybe I'll switch to this guy and turn this guy off. There we go. You'll have to turn up the pulpit mic if you could. Thank you so much. All right, let's see if that helps. Where was I? Dance day, yes, the culmination of a year, of course. You'll notice that the next hymn we're gonna sing is invites us to think of the Trinity as, as a, being entered into a dance, the dance of the Trinity, community uh, and, and, uh, and continuity and movement together. How does one learn how to dance? Well, you can be told, hold your arm up at this angle and kick your leg out at that angle. But if you're sitting on a bench and hear those words, it doesn't mean anything. You have to get out onto the dance floor and actually try it and learn by experience. This is what Jesus, I believe, was saying to his friends. There will come a time when you will understand all of what I'm saying through the lens of the empty tomb and all that I have done, but the Spirit will lead you and guide you to understand what is happening. This is, I believe, what happened to Peter and the disciples last week. We celebrated the coming in the Spirit, and, and Peter began preaching and began speaking, began teaching and began praying and fasting and, and organizing and serving. And through all of that, he learned what it was to be a part of this movement called the church that Jesus had worked so hard to create. Paul, too, was one who was called forth into motion by the Spirit, from being a, a, a protagonist against the faith to be an advocate for the faith. And we have his words in front of us today. And I'm, I'm going to invite you to pull those out because although Paul was not teaching a tr on the doctrine of the Trinity, you will see it right here. If you take a pen and circle the word God in the first line and then circle the word Christ in the second line, and circle the word Holy Spirit in the last line, and then if you start to draw the line from God to Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit to Christ, and Christ to God, you will see a triangle, a symbol for the Trinity. What is Paul getting at here as he mentions God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Well, he, he says, we are justified by faith. In the, in the particular context of writing to the Roman Christians, Paul realizes that there are two factions of Christians in Rome. There are those Gentile Christians who came to faith through belief in Christ, and there are those Jewish Christians who followed the law of Moses and also came to faith through Jesus Christ, and they were not getting along so well, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Imagine that, people with different perspectives not getting along too well. It only happened back then, right? No, Paul knew that, so he writes this. And what does he write? He says, we, we Christians, regardless of the label in front of it, are justified by faith. And therefore, we have peace with God. And I think he's hoping, though, here, we also have peace with one another because of that. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've obtained this grace in which we stand. And then he says, we boast. And all of a sudden, I think, hold on, I thought Christians were supposed to be humble. Why is Paul saying we boast? Let's look at what he's saying. The Jewish Christians were boasting about their connection to Moses and the law. And the Gentile Christians were boasting about their freedom, not having to do that. And so they were boasting about the wrong thing. So Paul says, listen, this is what we boast about. We boast about our sufferings. What? I boast about my grandkids, or I boast about my grilling skills, or I boast about my lawn being so green. I'm supposed to boast about my suffering? Yes, he goes on to say, because in that suffering, Christ has already met us. He took on the suffering of the cross to remind us that there is no suffering that we will go through that is not already hinted with a foretaste of God's victory. And so, yes, we boast of our sufferings because we're really boasting about our unity with Christ. And he goes on to say, because suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope, 
Hope in Christ does not disappoint us. Last summer, we were trying to convey during Vacation Bible School the meaning of the cross and the message of salvation to over 100 children here on a Thursday morning. And at one point, I was recounting the story of Jesus going to Golgotha, and we turned all the lights all the way down. It got a little bit, a little bit darker in the, in the room that morning. And we had all the guides and teachers and teacher's aides. They had glow sticks with them. And we were talking about the cross and, and, and the, the, the people who were out to harm Jesus and the, the, the violent act of that. And we had all the, the guides break those glow sticks, cracking them all over, creating kind of an aura of what's going on. And then they started shaking them and those glow sticks, as I talked about, those who put Jesus to death did it for, for harm. But God did something great through Jesus' suffering and death by raising him on the third day. And they held up those glow sticks and this sanctuary glowed with the light of Christ. Peter was transformed by Jesus. Even though he was one that denied him, he was transformed and called forth. So too Paul was called forth into this dance of God's spirit each of you are invited forward in faith as well into this community. So let me finally share something that I witnessed at the dance recital yesterday. It was very inspiring, as I mentioned, to see a spirit of cooperation and engagement and encouragement. And there were many moments where I wanted to stand up and shout and say amen. There was great display of strength and flexibility and balance and focus and agility. And there was one moment in particular that caught my attention as a preacher, and it's not the dances that our daughters did. They, they did wonderfully. They're older now. It was actually the dance of the tiniest of dancers who danced to a song, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. And these little dancers, probably four-year-old, came out in these shiny yellow rain jackets and shiny yellow rain hats. And although they had their dance shoes on, they had shiny little boots strapped on attached to their dance shoes. And they came out and they started moving to this song, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, and these little blue umbrellas that they picked up and they danced around. And at one point, the little girl center stage was doing her leg kicks and her little boot flew right off. <laughs> parabolic arc, perfectly landing right in the center of the stage. And for a second, she looked like, what should I do? I lost my costume. But in the blink of an eye, the audience there chuckled, not a mocking chuckle, but a supportive laugh. And the girl just kept kicking and kept dancing and kept going on with her partners up there. Oh, what a great image. Peter denied Jesus, but then was called forth in faith. Paul was working against Jesus, but was called forth to be an incredible apostle. Yes, we don't always get it right, but we are called by the Spirit's power to keep dancing together, to keep moving together, to keep praying and serving and learning so that the dance of the Trinity will unfold around us. And now to him who is able to accomplish abundantly beyond all we could ask or imagine, to him be glory, now and forever.